Welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. I'm Pookie Knightsmith and I'm your host. Today's question is, men don't talk about mental health, myth or masculine trait? And I'm in conversation with Tim Boughton. Yeah, so my name's Tim Boughton. Um, what about me? Um, well, I suppose um, I came from a broken home, um, uh, sort of adoptive parents and uh, and various things. Uh, I was really lucky to go to um, a school where I, I got a music scholarship. So I was a, a very musical as a child. Uh, I really um, didn't spend much time with my family over that whole period of time. Um, and so really then joined the army to, to try and find a family. So it was, um, that was way back in 1989, where I did a, a short commission with the army um, out in Hong Kong with the Gurkhas, the Queen's Gurkha Signals. Um, and then came back um, to then go to university, realised that university was far too difficult. So, um, uh, and I'm not very intelligent. So um, I ended up going back into the army full time. Uh, long story short, I served in a whole raft of places and uh, um, did various things. But I, I, I basically transferred then to fly helicopters for the Navy in 1996. Uh, and qualified in 1998 and became a commando helicopter pilot for uh, until 2008. At that stage, um, I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress. And um, many say post-traumatic stress disorder. I, I don't believe it's a disorder. And I'll come on to that sort of um, when we speak. But um, went through a whole system of, um, of CBT and EMDR, um, eye movement desensitization reprocessing for those that don't know it. Um, and then uh, a sort of span of a banking career in the city, um, interspersed with um, a lot of work around mental health and veterans' mental health, and really looking at mental health from a positive side rather than a negative side. Um, I believe that if you take control of your own mental health issues, if you develop this self awareness, then you have influence. And if you have influence, you have control. And if you have control, then you can sort of deal with this in the ways that you want to deal with it. Um, but it was very much then led to a path of helping people how to how to sort of um, gain that self-awareness. So I was then asked by the army to be their strategic advisor on mental health, um, which I started in May 2019. And then recently during COVID and, um, uh, you know, everything that's been going on there, the army asked if I would go back full time. Um, uh, in the appointment of Colonel Mental Health Engagement, which is really responsible for helping the army um, with everything to do around mental health and the education around mental health um, for the leadership, the chain of command, and also um, the, the um, soldiers and troops on the ground. So that's been hugely exciting. And then as well as that, founded a mental health company called um, the Elios Partnership with two other guys that have been um, uh, physically and mentally injured in Afghanistan and Iraq. And really that was to um, just to get out there to the corporate organizations and, uh, and blue light services and, and talk to them about the, uh, the, the positive aspects of mental health, this, this idea of a post-traumatic growth and a journey rather than if you find yourself with anxiety and panic, then that's it, there's nothing else. And I think one of the big things that I fought against was this whole idea of labeling. You know, people label you with something and that defines you. You know, we should not let our labels define us. We should define the way we are and how we deal with that. So in a nutshell, that's the sort of <laughs> bubble of how I got to where I am today. Wow. That's, you've, yeah, been, been through a lot and, and lots of different kind of uh, things have kind of added together, I guess, to, to where you are now. I'm interested to understand a little bit more about how you came to viewing mental health through a lens of kind of positivity um, and taking control. Is that a, a kind of journey that you went on um, or was that always your kind of point of view and take on it? No, it's a good question. And, and actually, it's it's I didn't realize that I had a mental health issue until I was it was pointed out to me and, and I was becoming uh verbally aggressive I was becoming offish I was becoming um you know I just wasn't I just wasn't the moment myself and um I think I, I really struggled with that to start off with then when I started reading up on it so I, I read a, a lot of books I read um one of the books that I read which really I credit with 
sort of literally saving my life is a, is a book called Professor Mark, by Professor Mark Williams and Danny Penman, sort of Mindfulness in a Frantic World. And it's really discovering this whole ability of, if you've had moral injury, if, you've had, if you feel guilt about something, if you feel, um, you know, if you feel you've done something you shouldn't done or have done, or, you know, A, the understanding that we're all human, we all make mistakes. And, you know, anyone who says it doesn't probably hasn't recognized it or is, a, you know, will do some stage in their life. But this ability to forgive ourselves and how do we forgive ourselves? How do we move on? How do we, you know, how do we look um, at the fact that we can learn from those mistakes or those injuries or, or you know, um, the, our childhood issues? And for me, you know, in the armed forces, less than 2% of mental health issues is caused through post-traumatic stress, believe it or not, although the public would have you believe that we're all mad and bad. Um, for me, it was very much childhood issues um, and issues through childhood. I'm really an aspect of needing to fit in and, 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 and having to, to fit in. So um, very long-winded way of answering your question. So for me, I sort of realized that as I went through that journey, I could either let myself sink back and just become a professional victim. So somebody that you know, was defined, labeled, I'm never going to succeed. I'm never going to move forward. I'm not that type of person. And so it was a, it was a real struggle. Okay. What is there out there that I can latch onto that can help me through, um, through this journey. And that's when I started to realize that actually, if we, if we, if we gain this self-awareness, um, and we can influence our condition, the way we think about our condition, then actually we can take control of it and, and, and take ourselves to a, to a greater place. So in my case, that looked very much like, you know, now I do a mindfulness session every morning. I um, try and do uh, some form of physical activity every single day. Um, and I will continue doing research. And hence the reason, you know, I, I said to you before we came online, you know, about my master's in mindfulness at Oxford. Um, you know, I spent sort of five very happy years there as a trustee being surrounded by people that had found mindfulness in some way, shape or form that had gone from being broken people to to actually finding peace and, and happiness living in the present moment we cannot change that past we cannot change what we've done in the past we cannot change who we are in the past neither can we define who we will be in the future but we can live in that present moment you know of, of being who we are here and now and if we do that you know one of the the lesser known factors that everyone knows is that we spend 88 percent of our mind subconscious mind in 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 in, uh, in in not being aware of our surroundings and what we do if we can increase that through being in the present moment then we have a wider outlook on life and we can take the blinkers off and we can sort of exist better i think sorry a very long-winded answer no don't apologize it's interesting hearing you talk about it and um going back a bit there you said that you weren't aware of your you know your your struggles or your need to, to kind of seek help until it was kind of pointed out to you how did that kind of come about who was it that noticed and what steps did you take to, to change things so it was my family and and my daughter at the time who came up to me said you know am I going to get good daddy or bad daddy's day because I've had enough of bad daddy um uh, and that was a shocking realization I think um but also it, it was a realization that I was probably in the wrong job <laughs> um a commute to London on a daily basis you know um from very early in the morning coming back very late at night um was not conducive to good to good mental health i thought that you know having transitioned from the military that i'd landed you know and that was the thing that i that, that was going to define me you know a, a sort of successful career in the city which was you know it was good while while it was there but um you know i very soon afterwards learned that actually we need to you know we need to really take control of what we do in our future in terms of you know being honest with ourselves about what is a, a right career or a wrong career um, so after that, that sort of initial shock and jolt, I went to see various people. I went to see a GP, I had a very bad GP who didn't really sort of help in any way, shape or form. Um, I went to some of the service charities. They were, you know, mediocre to say the least. And so that's when I really took it upon myself and said, I'm going to define my own journey of my recovery uh, and went and researched, you know, the best people to do CBT, the best people to do EMDR. Um, and then, you know, um, was recommended mindfulness and really sort of got into that as a sort of um, control um, for, for, for what had happened um, through that time. 
And I found that by doing that, I was happy to take other people's opinions and, 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 and what they said, but I could really distill what was useful and what wasn't, you know, as I went along that, that journey. And so I now find myself where I think, you know, I've addressed a lot of, you know, a large majority of my childhood issues. I've, um, I've got to a place where I'm stronger and, and more secure in, in, in who I am. Um, I've forgiven myself for, you know, a lot of the issues in the past, whatever they may be. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I'm driven, I, I'm driven every day by that, that sort of, that thought process and that, that, um, you know, that experience. Um, and for me, if I can do that on a daily basis to help others, then, you know, I've succeeded. I was going to ask how your own experience kind of led on to the the work that you've chosen to to kind of dedicate your time to now. So you've gone from someone who didn't recognise their own issues to someone who is very much proactively supporting and helping others to to recognise and respond to their own needs. So yeah. what kind of inspired you to do that, and what do you kind of hope to achieve in the work that you're doing? I think inspiration comes from knowing that you've helped somebody. Um, the first time I mentored somebody who was um, diagnosed with PTS and got them to a safe space. You know, we, we talk about this, you know, um, uh, promote, prevent, detect um, uh, 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 side of mental health. You know, if we can bring people back from the brink of clinical um, or from going from injured into the ill space, which is the clinical treat space, then... Um, they stand a higher chance, I think, of 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 of, of a re faster recovery, but also no, not relapsing back into that into that space. And for me, it's just the joy of being able to give something back. So I work a lot with um, veterans. I work a lot with, um, obviously, now current members of the armed forces. Um, and it's the ability to just give something back, um, and 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 basically, hopefully, change you know, a fairly old archaic policy that, that really, you know, there are a lot of people out there that don't really understand mental health. If we can educate them, if we can start them on a journey of survival, which we're doing through an army program called the Optimization Human Performance Through Stress Management Resilience Training, really yeah. catchy title, um, <laughs> called OpSmart, um, then we can, prepare, we can prepare people who have made the decision that they want to join the military on day one to help them, you know, for when they transition outwards. And suicide is a real issue not only in society but it's it's the same issue within the, the armed forces as well um although we're not specifically higher than you know civil society but um you know we've got to protect our people in a and what worries me more than anything else is, is we are in a complex world you know we have timothy galway says this, this brilliant um quote in his in the book called the inner game of tennis which is our performance is equal our potential minus our interference i don't know if you've heard of it but um if you take the interference as being emotional interference, if we can basically take our potential of who we are and we look at that interference of what we have today and our children are surrounded by social media 24 seven um, in an uncertain world, we're piling loads of debt on them now through COVID we're doing, you know, whatever it may be, we have to mentally prepare them in the best possible way so that they can cope with that, that form of life. And in the past where our ancestors have turned around and say, man up, you know, or it'll be, you know, you just put a stiff upper lip and everything else. Very, very good. But, you know, when you sit down with them and sort of say, yes, but in your day, you didn't have social media. You didn't have the stress of, you know, commuting to work like the way we do now. You didn't have the uncertainty. You didn't have the debt. You didn't have, you know, all these sorts of things. I think that then becomes a realisation that it's, it's our duty, all of us, to ensure that those that unfortunately are suffering with mental health issues, be they acute or be they, you know, severe, we have to, you know, come together and, and help and help them get through and we'll find a way to help them get through. Absolutely. And the, the kind of central question from this episode was around men and mental health and whether men are, are, are prepared to talk about their mental health and if that's a, a myth or a masculine trait. And I was interested to explore this because I have a worry about this um, rhetoric around men not talking about their mental health, which is that I fear that we talk about this a lot and we say we need to address the fact that men don't talk about their mental health. And I kind of almost feel that by saying that we need to do something about it, we almost reinforce what 
I, I'm not even sure how true it is anymore. But I just wondered, yeah, how much you experience that in your work, um, and yeah, what do we do about it if it is true? So, so I, I, I finally think it's the opposite. I think men are now more and more happy to talk about mental health issues. It's how you frame the psychological safety for them to do so. And if, so let me give you an example. We, we worked with a, with a fire service and the issues that are there through what the people see and, you know, dislocation of expectations in the current that fire service has been doing morgue duty and, you know, not their normal firefighting job. They have, they have, they've sort of, you know, that, 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 frame, that frame of reference has been removed. We set in, in motion a whole um, mental health, mental fitness and resilience package. But on day one, the chief fire officer stood up and said, I'm going to tell you what happened to me. I'm going to tell you how I have, have, have had mental health issues and how I've overcome them and how I regard them. We then broke down into focal groups, 25 firefighters, mixture of senior officers to firefighters to civil staff, everything. And I've never seen interaction like it because the psychological safety had been given by the fire officer to say, look, it's okay, go, go talk about it, use this forum. And it's amazing how many people are coming out saying, oh, I, I feel like this, I've had this, and somebody else would go, yeah, I had that. And this is how I dealt with it. So did you do that? Yeah, I dealt that too. And before, you know, we as the facilitator, were actually sitting back going, this is brilliant, and just letting people have the conversation and talk. And every so often we go, did you ever consider this? Oh, yeah, yeah, we should have done that, whatever it may be. And likewise, we then went into a law firm, which most law firms bastion of, 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 of sort of, you know, uh, sort of, you know, that, that sort of work ethic of, you know, work hard, you know, you're not, you can't have any issues and we'll just fight through. Um, again, the managing partner stood up and gave the most powerful testimony to all these partners. And I knew one of the partners who I know was living on the edge who was really in a bad place, but had said to me privately, I can't open up because I'll lose my job. I found himself in tears, letting forth the issues that he had. And the managing partner took him aside and, and literally took his mobile phone off him, his work phone off him and said, go away for two weeks. He said, your job is here. I don't want you to do any work. You're being paid. I want you to go off for two weeks. And by the way, I'm going to, you know, I want you to go see your GP or you get, you know, um, sign, be signposted accordingly. And that changed his life. That little moment of, of that, that sort of change of culture and ethos by somebody standing up and giving them permission. So to go back to your original question, I think a lot of people, a lot of men um, are not afraid fun enough to talk about mental health issues and i say that from the construction industry from the sporting industry through through the through, through the military as well i think where the issue lies is a generational issue the old school people who you know are the you know, just get on with it fight through you know it's not a problem but actually a large majority of those people that are that are espousing that 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 sort of ethos are people that are really having tight issues themselves they're having real inner battle that they feel that they will um, be seen to be weak if they um, expose that. And I was one of those people. I mean, you know, I was one of those people who, who mental health issues, don't be so stupid, you know, that doesn't, you know, it's weak, it's weak people that have those. But my God, am I a convert now? And, and, and I think that I, I, I would say in, in all the companies we've been into, in all the presentations we've given, I would honestly say, hand on my heart, that it's probably about 85 to 90% of men will talk about their issues and 10% to 15 that won't. Wow. And that's because you create that psychological safety where they feel able to, to kind of go there. Yeah, and I'm sure you're, you, you are absolutely right in that if you don't create that safe environment, if you don't sort of um, uh, preempt or set the set the foundations and the seams, then sure, people that 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 majority of people who don't talk about it will will be higher. But I don't. I think it is a myth that we regard that most men don't 
open up and talk. Um, it's just allowing them to do so in a dignified manner, you know, in the knowledge that they will not get backlash for it. They will be supported and helped because that's what the majority want. But also we've got to be really careful, I would say more so about the people that don't talk, the people that sit in the back of the room with their arms folded, the people that say, this is all rubbish, the people that say, you know, I don't believe in, in mental health and, and, and mental Ill, Ill health. Because my experience is traditionally, they're the ones that are in a worse position than the people who open up. And that rings true with my experience um, working with uh, young people in schools actually I've had a couple of occasions where um, I've talked to a big call of school kids and on the whole they've you know you've got their rapt attention and that's great and there'll be you know just one or two that are mucking about and what will generally happen is that they'll get hauled over by their teacher and actually they're the ones I want to talk to and generally I found that if I'm given the opportunity to speak with them separately there's usually something there that they need to open up about but it can feel very uncomfortable if you've you've not gone there and someone's talking about this stuff that's kind of scary and difficult and you don't know what might happen next can't it yeah what do you do in terms of you know obviously you're able to go in and you create that psychological safety because you're very used to doing that but what happens when you leave um what's the kind of legacy that you leave behind after your kind of training or your support to organizations so so we will not go into a business unless they have a system of mental health first aiders in place okay um that is the baseline you know so we've been asked to go into companies and we said okay how many mental health first aiders have you, what, what do you want about mental health first aiders right okay let's rewind let's go back to a baseline um and and, and make them understand what mental health first aid is i do not think that mental health first aiders are a panacea by the way but we we also um talk about this journey you, you cannot go into an organization and give them a lecture on mental fitness and resilience about how the brain works and how we do heightened awareness and you know all of those things that the, the habits and practices that we put in place to deal with anxiety or panic attacks or depression and expect that to be the quick fix and you know the uh, the, the sort of light bulb moment and then we will walk out so we very much um, look at follow-up we will do one-to-one -one. we will go back and then we'll do workshops and those workshops will be around so we'll do a survey after we've done the first session um, and the survey will sort of say what worked what didn't work what do you like what you did not like where are the issues what aren't the issues so we'll work with the organization and then what we'll do is we'll craft focus groups around that what is it that you you as a whole want to see or explore more and then what we'll do is we will put workshops and design workshops in place to address that and those workshops are where we will go through a workbook. Um, I haven't got one to hand, but we will we we'll sort of basically put a whole load of exercises in there. We'll refresh on the on the habits and, and you know and some of the some of the principles. And then what we do is we leave them with that workbook, which at the back of it um, has a um, um, has a strategy for their own mental health journey. So where you know a plan effectively. Well, how do you then take this forward, and how do you then um, work on it? What traditionally then happens is we'll then get a phone call from a company and say, look, can you do one-to-one -one coaching with so-and-so? Or can you come in and give us a further bit around line managers? Or can you give us a bit around partners or whatever? Um, so uh, if anyone phoned us up or, or, or phoned me up and said, look, we want you to do a, a one-shot wonder, I would respectfully decline. Um, because I, I think you can, you can end up letting Pandora out of the box or you know, out of Pandora's box, whatever it is, opening the lid. It, on so many issues that you then leave that person with and they don't know where to go or how to deal with it. Yeah. There is not one um, lecture we have given, and we've given a lot, um, where we haven't had a personal disclosure within that session. Uh, and some of them have been um, suicidal idealization. Um, others have been, I'm asking for a friend. Um, another one is my son is, my daughter is um but mostly it's like um you know i can't work at this company anymore i don't know how to tell them i'm worried about my job you know i'm just having sleepless nights um you know i'm responsible for a team which i can't control you know all of those sorts of things which if the organization didn't have in place a system of dealing with that you know it would be fairly catastrophic
Yeah, absolutely. So you're taking a very, um, it, it's not, it, it's a longer term approach. You're building a relationship and a, and, a, and a real understanding, which I think is really important. And like you, I find that wherever I go, the disclosures follow me. And it, how do you manage that? Because actually, you know, you've, you've had your own um, struggles and issues and taking that on board from other people all the time is, is quite stressful, no? So we have a very good system and that is um, we signpost um, we uh, ensure, so to give you an example, we had, we went into one business where the, the, um, the chief financial officer was in a bad way um, and that came out of the disclosure in one, one of the lectures. Um, I took them to, to a private office um, really um, uh, brought them off the ceiling and then really to a sort of low level through mental health first aid, you know, that sort of those tenants. And then I got the managing partner. I said, right, my recommendation is that you now need to sign for this person to their GP. Um, uh, and then the system, your system will take over from there. So that, that sort of happens. That's how we deal it with it on the ground. Yeah. In terms of the three of us, so Tim, Ollie, and myself, um, um, we, we, we are really good, because um, we're all ex-military, we're really good at debriefing each other. So we will sort of say, are you okay with that? Did you do anything, click any bells or anything else like that? And, and, you know, nine times out of 10, the answer is no. But if there is something, we'll talk it through. And because we're so, you know, good at, at doing that with each other, it, it, it's, it's, never, it's never been an issue. But the other thing is, is, is that we all, we all absolutely made sure that we were psychologically robust and in a really great place before we even started this business. Um, because there are too many people out there delivering so-called mental health first aid or mental health or or whatever it is under that under that um, that banner because it's a sexy thing to do. Um, who are in a really bad place themselves um, and are using it as therapy for themselves, but not realising that actually people are presenting on the other side of it. Do you think that's a significant issue within the sector? Then people kind of with lived or living experience, perhaps wanting to help on some level, but maybe doing harm to either themselves or others. No, I, I believe that learned experience is um, is really powerful. So, you know, myself, you, whoever it is, have got the learned experience, and it's really, really powerful because you can you can almost step in other people's shoes. You know, you know, you know the the the, sorry. the problem comes when people are uh, are going through recovery uh, and are doing it to aid their recovery. And are basically, you know, getting personal disclosures in those sessions, or we'll do it for a one-shot wonder. So we'll go and say, right, you know, this is when I, this is how I got um, PTSD in Afghanistan. We were in this situation, and we were shooting that, and this happened, blah blah blah, blah, blah you know, and 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 this what this is what happened. It's a great story, but unfortunately, it it leads other people to sort of go, oh, right, I'm recognizing symptoms now that that I might have. So you've got to be able to deal with that as well. Yeah, so it's about being able to do it safely, isn't it? Yeah. Talk to me about PTSD, question mark. So you, you don't believe in the D. T tell me more about that. The first thing to say, I think, is everyone is different. And, um, you know, everyone has their own different journeys. So for me, um, a lot of my um, PTS came from childhood experiences. Um, and... You know, a lot of that is the reason why I went to the military to try and find a family. You know, I was always trying to fit in along that route. Um, uh, and I think, you know, it was only, you know, not, not an awful long time ago that I sort of found what the real, who the real me was. But in that interim period, I made a huge amount of mistakes. So for me, having gone through that journey and the, had the diagnosis, the label, been given the label, um, to me, a disorder is something that you cannot change or is something that you, are, you will live with for the rest of your life. You will, you know, you will, you will medicate for it, whatever it may be. Um, and again, I must stress everyone is different. For me, um, I was never going to live with a label. I was never going to live with a label of having a disorder. I was always going to fight and strive a way in which um, I would come out uh, and, and, and leave that behind. Um, I never went on medication. That was my personal choice. Um, I believe for me that if I'd gone on medication, then I, I, I wouldn't maybe have come off it or I didn't want that uncertainty that I might come off it. 
So it was how can I put in place those those um, you know those 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 things that that would that would offset me going on medication, be it you know doing lots of fizz, mindfulness, um, you know finding a new sense of purpose, developing a new frame of reference that really helped me on that journey to fight you know what I've been labelled. Um, and so for me, I, I never considered, or I don't consider that I've had a disorder. Um, I consider that I've had a, uh, a, a moment in time where my brain has just, it's all got too much. My stress container has got too, too full. And at the time, I didn't have the tools and the ability to work out how to turn the tap on that allows that all to sort of fade down. My sediment layer within that, within that was probably up here. So my room for expansion was very little. But actually, through mindfulness and everything else, that expansion, that sediment layer has come down to here. So my expansion level is now quite high. And just by managing that on a daily basis um, enables me to sort of um, feel that I've gone through to post-traumatic growth. So if I had a disor you know, disorder, for me personally, I think it would have stunted what I believe that post-traumatic growth graph to be. And tell me about post-traumatic growth. That's something you've mentioned a, a couple of times and presumably quite relevant in, in the work that you're, um, you're doing with the army and with others as well. What does, what does that mean? What does that look like? It sounds like a real positive out of a negative. Yeah, I think if you, if you look at mental health in a positive way, then you're striving to work out how can you use your learned experience to make you stronger. And if we take anxiety, for instance, Many people don't recognize that, you know, what causes anxiety or why the fight and flight reflex happens. You know, what is the, the amygdala telling us? Why, do we, why does it happen? You know, is it fear, false evidence appearing real? So is our brain telling us that what is happening is real, but actually it's not real? You know, as soon as we start to understand how all that works, then actually we can react to those situations quicker. So all our brain is doing, have I seen this situation before? Yes, I have. What was my reaction? My reaction was to go panic. Okay, so bang, have some panic. And we will you know, panic away. If we can drag that out of our subconscious and actually interrupt that flow and go, hold on, stop. So I'm a great believer in, in this phrase that we came up with, which is stop, breathe, reflect, and choose. In any situation that we are in, whether it's somebody flicking you the Vs in a car or cutting you up on the motorway, if we just go stop, okay, I'm engaging my conscious mind. Breathe. I'm grounding myself in the present moment and just stopping that adrenaline coming in the cortisol level. Reflect. Okay, if I stick the bees back at that person or I get angry, is it going to achieve anything? No, because they're half a mile ahead. Or if I answer back in the way that I want to shout at this person down the phone, is it going to achieve anything? No, because actually it'll all be over. So choose. I can choose my reaction. I can choose how I want to deal with it. And before long, our brain takes that on board so that the next time that you feel that anxiety or panic or somebody cuts you off on the motorway, you suddenly go, hold on a second, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't react to it. And that is the learned experience that we have and how we can train our brain to bring things back into the conscious um, and re, reprogram the way in the back of our head, you know, where all our, all our library of learned experiences is stored um, next time the brain goes into the library, it goes, oh yeah, okay, no, I've been re reprogrammed on this one. This is how I'm going to react. Do you think that becomes easier with time then? The more that we do it, the more that we're able to access the different... Oh, without a shadow of a doubt. Yeah, and, and this is why um, you cannot hope to get to a position of post-traumatic growth and you cannot hope to get to a position of um, stronger mental fitness and resilience if you don't practice it. Mm. If we're an Olympic athlete, we train hours and hours a day to get to that situation. Our physical is no different from our mental. The two are intertwined. So if we train our physical to that ability, why do we not devote an hour a day training our mental? You know, why do we not give it? We have one brain. That brain, once it's gone, once it's, you know, once it's um, you know, not functioning properly, affects us in so many ways in our life in so many ways so why do we not look after it and give it the time it deserves is that um part of the kind of focus for your masters that you're starting mm. so i want to um a mindfulness is not it's not for everyone but 
it must be something because it's based in 3,000 years of, of teachings. Yeah. It's, uh, I look at it from a very non-secular way. You know, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a massively religious person, um, but I do, I do believe that there is something there from the way the Buddhist teachings are there, the Sati's to, to where, we, where we are, you know, where we are, where we are now and can use it now. And I think that, you know, what mindfulness enables us to do is to really take stock of just the pressure from the outside world, um, the technology, the social media, you know, with the social media, you know, life issues, you know, everything. And, it, you know, and just pause in the way that we deal with things and, and get ourselves to a, um, you know, to a much calmer way of dealing with things. Because you're always going to have people who hate you. You're always going to have people that don't like the way you do things. You're always going to cheese someone off. You know, you're always going to get it wrong. We are human at the end of the day. And I think if we can realize that, then, you know, it, it, you can just drop all those things that you can't control. And it's a really cathartic experience. You know, it, it's worrying about things that you just have no control over is just so much wasted effort um and you'll know that from from your background but you know it is it is about it is about really rebalancing your life and for some it works you know it takes a lot of practice yeah. mindfulness is not something that you can go and dial up headspace and do you know a couple of sessions a week and all of a sudden you're 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 a deadly ninja um, it is it is something that you know takes practice and and and, and you know, regular practice, and that's where I come back to saying you know if we train our mind, if we give our mind nutrition, which mindfulness is, then actually it will pay us back in spades. Yeah, I find mindfulness personally quite tricky because if I give myself that much space without a focus of a thing I'm doing, that's when the memories and and stuff tend to to kind of invade uh, in, a, in often quite a tricky way that said I found doing things mindfully really really helpful so I climb a lot and I find that if I'm just wholly in that moment and I'm focused entirely on on the climbing and I do that in a really mindful way that that for me is helpful but I think yeah for different people different things help don't they yeah and I think that you know mindfulness is not about trying to exclude thoughts or 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 you know change the way um, those thoughts are mindfulness is about just being non-judgmental about the thoughts that come into our mind and either giving them the rec just giving them the recognition and then moving on. It's not about fighting them or, or, you know, those thoughts. So if you have thoughts that bring back bad memories, it's not about giving them the airtime to really go over what those bad memories are. It's about sort of training our mind to say, okay, I recognize that they're going to be there. I'm going to move on and I'm going to think of something else. It's, 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 not, it's, it's just being non-judgmental about things. It's really easy to say. I get it. It's really difficult to do. But actually what you're doing um, is mindfulness in a mindful manner. So whether we brush our teeth in a mindful manner, whether we eat in a mindful manner, whether we walk, climb, you know, I fly. So I fly helicopters. So for me, being, you know, in the sky is one of the most, is one of the most mindful things that I can do. There is never a day where I don't land and, and, and feel as though, you know, the whole weight of the world has been taken off my shoulders. Um, so, yeah, it, how you do it, it's very personal to you, I think. And music, do you still have music in your life? Because you talked about being a music scholar as a youngster and I'm a very amateur pianist. And I find that, again, for me, because it takes so much focus, that's a hugely mindful activity. Yeah, so my daughter is, is, um, is a music scholar at her school as well. And, and um, so I, I'm sort of happy to come back into it. So I, I was a... I did um, piano, organ, trumpet, and sax um, were my were my instruments, and um, you know I, I I was classically trained. Then went into jazz. Um, then then sort of went into a bit of um, other stuff, and so you know I've come back to the piano now um, because my daughter came back to it. Um, but you know I went from playing Vidors to Carter and, and Bach's Fugue and D minor and all these sorts of things to now where I'm. You know, I know that I will never get that back. So that ability to go back because, you know, I was practicing hours a day and, and everything else. Um, but I see the joy of music through my daughter now, um, through her violin. And every so often I've got a piano right next to me here, actually. 
every so often I'll just you know jump on it and play something and just you know yeah I mean and and, and my daughter's school if they're you know if they're calling out for a, a parent trumpeter at Christmas carols I'll I'll dust off the trumpet and give it a go but apart from that that's about it <laughs> see the main reason I started playing piano was because um my uh, daughter started playing the trumpet which I used to play as a youngster and when I picked it back up after many years it was so hard and I just thought I'd rather start with something new I you know it made me think oh I'd like to play again but it's really hard it, as you say going back to something that you once used to be able to do really well and just not yeah. that anymore um what do you use your the the your work around mindfulness in your work with the army um and this this kind of new and growing role that you have there or is that quite a different approach no so it's a really good question and a topical one actually because um trying to trying to teach a whole load of, of, of hairy soldiers um, and, um, and and wonderful ladies about uh, mindfulness um, funnily enough it's been, I thought it was going to be really fought against and, and and actually it's been it's been it's been quite welcomed but there has been no governance around it there's been no um, there's been no uh, sort of engagement with someone like the Oxford Mindfulness Centre. And, and the Oxford Mindfulness Centre is probably the world's leading research-based um, mm -hmm. and evidence-based um, centre for mindfulness. Uh, you know, John Cabot's in his things in the States, but you know, Oxford is, is regarded as that. So what I'm trying to do through, that, through the mindfulness is that as part of that, and there is a part of the, the, the dissertation phase and the, and the teaching phase, is design a programme that we um, can have validated that will be for the army to use through mindfulness. Um, and because of having come from that background, um, I can tailor it to land better within that environment. Um, but there, there is great openness to it. I mean, there's a, there's a defense mindfulness steering group, there is a defense mindfulness initiative. Um, you know, we're, we're using mindfulness in parliament now for some of the parliamentary groups. So it's very much being looked at as, I think the, the, the one conflict that you have is that, um, is that mindfulness is very much, you know, everyone sees mindfulness as this um, uh, connection with the Buddha, very peaceful, you know, for peaceful means. The army and the military, when you, when you then, and the Americans have done this a lot with um, their special forces and their army, is that, you know, you, if you then use mindfulness to make you a more enhanced killer, then that is where that is a real issue. And I have a real issue over it. You know, if it makes you a better person and the consequences of making you a better person mean that you do your job better, then I can sort of live with that. But my interest in this is to help people within the family context, you know, the wives and the partners and the, and the husbands, uh, spend a lot of time with their other halves away, you know, and dealing with that. There is then this sort of, you go and sort of um, have your own um, way of doing things. You know, your partner will come back from operations having done their own way. You come together, you get this. You know, if we can, if we can just have met, develop that understanding of, you know, what each other goes through, but also the children. And for me, the real focus is if we can get the children, you know, and the, and the families and the husband speaking the same language around mental fitness and resilience and mental health and within that maybe mindfulness, then that will deliver a uh, huge effect. Um, you know, we, there, is a, there is quite a divorce rate within the military, um, not unsurprising, especially when you, you, know, you had Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, so we have to look at ways now where we include the families and dependents as well as the people who are on the front line. Sounds like an incredible piece of work. How, um, no, like, yeah, how, how long, you know, is there a particular time period that you're doing this over or is it an open project? No, so it's a master's two years. Yeah. Um, and within that two years will be me writing the program, um, you know, teaching, getting yeah. some validation uh, to then launch. Um, I'm really lucky in that there's a, there's a chap in the, in the army already who is, done a phenomenal amount of work on mindfulness um who i hope to collaborate with and we've spoken so you know it, it hopefully won't be starting from scratch so that's a good thing wow brilliant and what are you hoping will happen next in terms of your your work and the different avenues it might take you and the impact it might have 
So I've been a really, I'm quite a um, entrepreneurial spirit. So um, I tend to live by my seat of the pants in terms of work, much to the annoyance of everyone around me. Um, but you know, I've got I've got an opportunity opening up with an American, you know, great American family who are, who want to open up a, a sort of basically a, um, a high end well being um, uh, uh, and leadership centre um, here in the UK, uh, and they want me to run that well on the side of that, which which I will do. Um, uh, there is um, a lot more to be done within the army, and that the, the sort of once I finish being mobilised in December, I fall back to being a strategic advisor, and I'm there until 2024. So there's more I'll be doing within that space. Um, the veteran space, I'd love to. I'd love to work more within the veteran space, but it's so toxic. Um, there are there are two types of veteran. There's the veteran that wants to do good and, and positively you know, um, further their, what they're doing. And then there's a veteran that wants to be a professional victim the whole time and will, you know, nothing you do will be right and it will all be wrong. And, and I've been trolled rather too many times for my own comfort um, on, you know, likes of Twitter and other things to actually, um, to actually want to get really involved with that because it's wasted energy um, and I can't control, you know, what other people think. Uh, yeah. Some of it has been absolutely, you know, I've had death threats. I've had, you know, I've, been called a coward and you know um uh you know um liar pathological liar all sorts of things just for trying to help out people through that through that journey um so i'll stick with the things that i know i'll stick with things with things where it's going to be well received um and i'll do it with like-minded people but you know i'm unfortunately I'm a, I'm a sucker that if somebody rings me up and says look i'm struggling i need some help can you give me some wise words i'll, I'll of course i'll do that because that's what i believe that I personally need to give back to the organisation I spent 20 years in. Wow, but many plans then. It sounds like you've got, yeah, irons in many fires and, and, and you know, lots of potential for impact there, which is, is really positive. What, what thought would you like to, to close with? What's the thing that you'd like to, to leave in people's minds who've taken the time to listen in today? Uh, thank you for getting to this point initially. <laughs> um, I think if you're, if you're, thinking that you are struggling and you are worried about how people will react don't it is the one the one most liberating thing was to be able to just say i have a problem and i need some help and you will find that the doors will open around you and it won't be this you know cage that you think it will it won't be people thinking any less of you actually they'll think you're brave and that you're strong for for opening up.